Well, would you stand with us? We're going to say this creed together as we do every week. Hold your hands out like this as a way of receiving from the Lord. Let's say this together. I am not what I do. I am not what I have. I am not what people say about me. I am the beloved of God. It's who I am. No one can take it from me. I don't have to worry. I don't have to hurry. I can trust my friend Jesus and share his love with the world. Thanks. You can be seated. All right. Well, today we want to talk about the importance of, of hearing God's voice. The first, the main thing I want to accomplish today for every person is to demystify this idea that hearing God's voice is something that is only for special people or for pastors or prophets or, or even that it's a weird thing. In fact, I know probably everybody in this room has heard God's voice, even though, you know, even though they may not know it. I believe that God speaks to non-Christians and unbelievers all the time. I want to share with you three stories where I heard God's voice, and all three of them pivotally changed my life. The first, uh, I want to be careful here because I borderline idolized my, my grandpa, the, the, the founder of the Crystal Cathedral. Important minister in his day was, you know, had such a huge impact, and so I just want to share my experience. This is not a dig on him at all. When I was a kid, uh, I had this, I, I got into art in like third or fourth grade. I just loved it. And I really enjoyed clay. And I, I was into like fantasy type things. I loved the never ending story, for example. And I, I loved the Hobbit and other things like that, you know. And this was the 80s, you know. It was like at an all time high when these types of things were going on. I made this clay dragon that uh, I was really proud of. I, I spent a lot of time on it, and I used what I thought was really creative, a dark shoe polish to give it that dragony kind of purple color, you know. I was going for sort of a, a, a Puff the Magic Dragon kind of look, and I loved this, this dragon, and I submitted it to the Orange County Fair. My teacher suggested it, and I got first prize for my grade. I decided in that moment I was going to switch from whatever I was going to be when I was going to grow up. I was going to be an artist. Now, my grandpa, um, I think back in the day, you know, my grandpa asked me w once, what do you want to be when you grow up? And I said something like, I want to be a minister like you. And he would, you know, pat me on the head. And this was like our tradition, you know. And he'd pe now, before I say the next thing, you have to know my grandpa was the worst driver ever, okay? Really terrible. And I think it's because he's a visionary or whatever. There was, I think only, I don't, I'd heard stories many times about how bad of a driver he was they were all underplayed. He got in so many accidents and tickets that they eventually revoked his license. So, so he, he had to have a driver. And, and, and that, I, I feel like that's important to say because you're like, why did your pastor grandpa pick you up with a driver? But he was Dr. Schuler, so of course it was a limo. So when I was a kid, he would pick me up sometimes from school in a limo. And I was always a little embarrassed by that, but there's part of me that was cool. But I'd be standing out with my friends, and, you know, a, guy, a guy's mom and her minivan would come and pick up the kids and say bye. And then, like, this limo would pull up. You know, this is the 80s again. And, like, limos reached their peak in the 80s, really. It was a great time to be in a limo. Pulled up. You know, a guy with a hat on comes out and opens the door for me, and I, and I, and I get in the car. And... This time, my grandpa said, Bobby, what do you want to be when you grow up? And I said, I want to be an artist. <laughs> His response was kind of like, not mean at all, but kind of like, well, you know. And it was just, we would start talking about other things, and he'd come back to the art thing, where he'd be like, you know, artists can't really, they really struggle a lot, you know, to pay the bills, and da 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 and this kind of thing. And this was the first time I, I got this feeling of, oh, do I have to be a minister? Like, is, do I have a choice? And, you know, I, I was kind of, for a couple of years of my life in high school, very much against God, actually. I, I, won, I liked Nirvana and Alice in Chains, you know? I liked, that, I liked my stuff and my friends and, and my life. And, and so even after I came to faith and, and was totally hook, line, and sinker for God, for the Lord, I still was very against the idea of, of ever going into ministry. And I remember once after being in, you know, this kind of revised heart for God phase of my life, 
About a year after that, I was at an event called Choir of the Fire, which is like a teen event. It's like a worship event where they really encourage kids to um, have quiet times in the morning and, and, and have like a revival time, kind of spirit. And we were in this worship time, and this was the first time I really felt like God spoke to me. We were praying, and I was worshiping, and it felt like God said to me, Bobby, go on your knees and worship me. And I didn't really do it because I thought, well, that's a little extreme and kind of weird. I'm not going to do that. And then I felt it again, Bobby, get on your knees and worship me. And I, I still didn't do it. And then the third time, almost I was going away, I was like, Bobby, get on your knees and worship me. And I did. And I, I was scared that I was going to miss out on something. And so I started worshiping God. And all of these teenagers began praying for me. And I actually felt physically like God broke something in my will, in my heart, that all of my resentment towards feeling, like if you know my personality, feeling controlled at all is repulsive to me. I, I, am a, I am a free bird, man. I like to do things my way. And, and, and so letting go of this really um, ice cold resentment I had towards feeling control in my life, God totally broke it in my heart. And I began doing you know, mission trips like Hannah did, humanitarian trips, and just allowing, just trying to serve more and not, not being about me as much. And that's why it truly is a miracle, not only that I'm in ministry, but that I took over my grandpa's church. If you know my soul and my mind, it's actually crazy that I'm even here. And it's 100%, I think, in large part, because of this one prayer event. So doing that just submitting to God, it just broke something in me in a really good way. The second time I was uh, in Germany, uh, serving at the Expo 2000 in this village called Bed Gondersheim. Beautiful little village. I loved it there. It was wonderful. And we were there for six months working with David Maines and doing um, different type of concerts. We got to meet all sorts of famous people. It was very cool, but it was still and David wanted me to go to Israel, which was even cooler. I, I'd been wanting to go to Israel, and they were going to fly me f from Germany to, uh, to Tel Aviv, to Jerusalem. And I was like, okay, I'll go. Let's do it. And then as I was praying, I felt the strong unction that I shouldn't go. And it was so strong, it was like bugging me around the clock. So I told David and the crew, I was like, I can't go. I just feel like God doesn't want me to go. And surprisingly, they were fine with that. I mean, this is my employer, you know. And then uh, they asked me a couple weeks later, hey, I, can you go out to Israel? We really need you to go. We need you out there to shoot some stuff. It'll just be a couple days and you can come back. And I was like, I, and I was feeling all this pressure. So I kind of said, yeah, let me, can I just pray about it? And I was just praying about it. And then my mom called me and she's like, I felt like this very strong thing, like you shouldn't go to Israel. So I told him, I was like, I just can't. I had this very strong sense. For, it's something I wanted to do. I'm, I'm an adventurer. I love traveling. I've been to Israel a million times. I was like, I just feel like I can't go. And so they said, all right. They, I, they were visibly a little upset with me. The next week, the Intifada started in Israel. It was a complete black swan event. Nobody was seeing it come. And, and uh, the, whole, you know, the whole country was covered in violence and bombings and riots. And the studio, which was in Bethlehem in the Palestinian part, was the, the studio crew was locked in there for two months after that. Very dangerous situation. Nobody ended up being hurt, but I was, I was jokingly saying earlier that I would have gotten hurt in that situation because I wouldn't have stayed in a studio for two months. I was like, we're breaking out of here. And so there, I really do believe God protected me from something that could have been really bad that happened in my life. And the third, I remember when Russ was having some talks, Pastor Russ was having some talks with some of the people at Irvine Presbyterian and he called me to see if that would be, a merger would be something I would even entertain or be interested in. And I had, to be honest with you, some prejudices about the PCUSA, and I'd heard some things, and I know there was a lot of, you know, turmoil and difficulty. I was driving my car, and after we hung up, I was kind of on the fence about it, and I said out loud, I go, God, you really want me to join the PCUSA? And I felt like a, the, this very strong, do not call unclean what I have made clean. And it was striking. And I was like, whoa. And actually, after that event, I don't know if I've told you guys this, especially from the IPC side, I had zero concern that this would or would not work. I kind of knew from the beginning, I'm not going to be able to stop this. This is God's idea. God is planning on doing this. And even though it was a lot of work, 
I, I also wanted to come in with like an open mind. And what I found is in our denomination, especially our pres presbytery, some of the most best friends, allies, God, Holy Spirit filled people like Tim McCalmet, you know, just that love the Lord. And I felt really bad actually about, about these, you know, being able to just throw off a whole group of people like that without really knowing anything about it. And so these are ways in which, and, and that, I mean, that made a huge difference in, in the life of, in my life and this church's life. So you can see that God, and God didn't do that because I'm a pastor, by the way. God did that because I'm his son. He'll do that to you because you're his daughter or his son. It has nothing to do with your office. It has everything to do with the fact that he loves you and he wants to play a, a role in your life and get you to good places. So God speaks today. And God likes to speak to you. And it is on us to learn how to hear God's voice. We know that it's God's voice if, one, if it's not my idea, if it's a eureka, wow, I would have never thought of something like that. And if it bears good fruit, and if it aligns with scripture, if it's those things, it's probably God speaking to you and giving you a special kind of, of revelation. Of course, Jesus teaches us in many of his sermons to hear the voice of the shepherd, to hear the rhema, the spoken voice of God. In John 15, he says, anyone who abides in me and my words, my rhema abides in them, meaning they hear my spoken voice, they'll ask whatever they want from me and it will be given to them. He talks about how the, the sheep know the voice of their shepherd. In fact, that's the passage we're reading today. John chapter 10. Before I read John chapter 10, this comes on the heels of a really important story of the famous healing of the blind man. It's not just any blind man, it's a John 9 blind man. This guy had been cast out of the synagogue and he had been called a sinner. And the evidence that he was a sinner was because he was blind. So he had been taught that the reason he was blind it was, it was God cursing him for some sin, either from him or his parents. So not only was he couldn't see and couldn't work, they didn't have any like, you know, welfare or something for blind people back then, he just had to beg. But also he, he had a sense of shame about being there. So it was like double, a double curse, you see? So they ask him, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he should be born blind? Jesus says, neither. He, this, this happened so God could be, God's life could be revealed in him. And so Jesus, on the Sabbath, does two things you're not supposed to do according to oral tradition. Now, the Bible doesn't say this. The Bible says you shall honor the Sabbath. But the oral tradition says, well, what does that mean to honor the Sabbath? And a couple of things you're not supposed to do is spit. You can't spit on the Sabbath because spit rolls and that looks like work. And you can't make mud on the Sabbath because that's like what the Jews did when they were in captivity making bricks. And so Jesus spits on the ground making mud so not only is he healing on the Sabbath, he really wants the Pharisees to see that he's defying the oral tradition. He wants them to see outright that it's better to defy oral tradition to help someone. And he does. So he heals the man. And this creates a huge dilemma in the synagogue where the Pharisees are like, this, is, this man's from God. We have to rethink our oral, oral tradition. And the others were like, no, the most important thing is to honor the Sabbath. The only way he can do a miracle and sin is he has to be from Satan. And this is the debate that we go on, that's going on. And the guy that's just been healed is watching this circus and is thinking, this is the most plain thing ever. A man healed me. He's from God. Like, how can you even debate this? And by the end, the tables turn where the elitist religious leaders, you see them as being like kind of fools. They're like people that probably have studied the Bible and they know everything and they just clearly don't even know God at all. And they're, they're cursing this guy for being healed on the Sabbath. And at the end, Jesus finally says, those who are blind will see. So he's talking about spiritual vision now. And those who see, that is the Pharisees, will become blind. How are they blind? They get blinded by tradition. They get blinded when they've sorted everything out. They've already laid it all out. And they can't clearly see that God just likes to break our rules sometimes. And we don't control God. And he can use whoever he wants. 
He can do whatever he wants, whenever he wants, however he wants. He's God. And we can't figure him out, really. You just got to trust him. So this comes on the heels of that. So Jesus, at the very end of that, says, very, I, very truly, I tell you Pharisees, anyone who does not enter through the sheep pen by the gate but climbs in some other way as a thief and a robber. So this is him saying he's not sent from Satan, but that he's the shepherd itself. And he says, the one who enters by the gate is the shepherd of the sheep, he being the shepherd, Jesus. The gatekeeper opens the gate for him. The sheep listen to his voice. He calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. When he has brought out all his own, he goes on ahead of them and his sheep follow him because they know his voice. Because they know his voice. They know his voice. But they will never follow a stranger. In fact, they will run away from him because they do not recognize the stranger's voice. Clearly, it is important for us as disciples to do what Jesus is saying here, to hear his voice. I remember Ray Vangelin, who was, uh, was a great biblical scholar and lived with the Bedouins for a long time in his younger years, told a story about wandering the desert with Bedouin shepherds. Now, most shepherds throughout history and still today are, are not men, they're teenage girls. I think I've relished telling you this a million times. It's one of my favorite things. That when you read about shepherds in the Bible, picture a 15-year-old girl, okay? Or a 12-year-old boy. So, so prepubescent boy or like a teenage girl. And as he's wandering around the desert, these girls are either driving goats or the sheep, you know, you drive goats, they go in front of you, or you walk in front of sheep, they follow you. And so the, the shepherd girl was with these sheep and they went to the desert and she saw some of her friends who were other shepherds and in this pasture, all the sheep mixed together. And there were three or four shepherds with three or four different flocks. And as the girls started chatting to each other and telling stories and talking about this or that and whatever, he was wondering as all of these sheep started mixing and matching, how are they gonna un, how are they gonna fix this? How are they gonna unmix all of these sheep that are hanging out with each other. And then he marveled when they were all done and all four girls went in four different directions. They all started shouting at their sheep in Arabic. He also remarked at how good the Arabic was of the sheep. That was a surprise. How all the sheep split up perfectly into the four proper groups. They knew their voices. So that when this one went, all the sheep, and they all looked the same, but the shepherds knew and it all unmixed itself because all the sheep knew the proper voice of the shepherd girl that they needed to follow. This has always been this way, I guess. I would, I would imagine. I would assume this is, this is how it was in Jesus' day. That people had seen this phenomenon. That, shep, that sheep just kind of know the voice of their shepherd. If you're, you're a parent, you're, you know what it's like to know the voice of a sheep. And I've seen this also happen where you have 10 parents, 15 parents at a playground and like 20 or 30 kids all playing, all the same age, all of them that's, have that squealy kid voice, and a kid gets hurt, and a kid screams and yells, the right mom will stand up. You know, what, some kid screams and goes, ah, oh, it's mine, I got it. There's like this, and as a dad, it happens to me too. When my kid screams, I instantly know that's my kid, not someone else's kid. This is what Jesus teaches us that discipleship is supposed to be like. That although there's a lot of noise and voices, we know, we have spiritual ears, and we know what the voice of the shepherd sounds like. All right. So I'll just finish with this. So three things. Number one, when God speaks to us, it's not paranoid schizophrenia. You're not usually hearing an actual audible voice. God speaks in knowledge, like a stamp. Boom. You just know. God has a language. It's not English, it's knowledge. Boom, just, I know it. And I believe that it has a level of intensity. I think sometimes God speaks to us just through inspiration. We just feel inspired. Whereas other times we feel like, do not call unclean what I have made clean. Um, I think God speaks to non-religious, non-believing people all the time. You know the story about Balaam's donkey? 
where Balaam turns and speaks to Balaam. Well, one thing we forget is that Balaam was a witch. He was like a, like a soothsayer who was not Jewish or even good. He was like a kind of a bad guy, but had a regular uh, conversation with God all the time. Now, uh, God is sovereign. He can speak to whomever he wants, whenever he wants, and I think sometimes he will just speak to people because he wants to, and that's okay. If you think that maybe there was a time where you felt really inspired, or you really felt like maybe that was God, but I wasn't really, you know, going to church at the time, it was probably God. So we want to distinguish that signal from the noise. If you're on a cell phone, and you're talking to someone, and maybe there's a lot of white noise, maybe there's traffic in the background, you can hear people playing, maybe there's even some static coming through the phone, you can still hear the voice even though there's all those other loud noises going on. Those other loud noises may be louder than the voice you're hearing, but you can still hear the voice because you've learned through talking on the telephone how to distinguish a signal from the noise. What's the noise? The noise, the question is, is that God? Is that Bobby? Is that me? Or is that Satan? Or some kind of dark thing? And there's a way to distinguish that. If it's highly narcissistic, self-congratulatory, self-gratifying, it's probably just you trying to talk yourself into eating that cinnamon roll, which <laughs> I will do this afternoon. You know, it's just you. You're just thinking. It's fine. Uh, if, it's, if it's contempt, like bitterness, uh, if it is shame, like I'm a terrible person, I'm the worst, of course I did that. You know, that's different than correction, but like, I'm a bad person, I'll never be better, I'll never get over this thing. Or if it's, I'm trying to remember what's another thing, fear, if it's like dread, if it's like, not like, not like uh, temperance, but, but like actual dread, like, uh, like, I can't do this, I can't get that, I can't, uh, I can't face this thing. I think that's Satan, actually, or satanic in some way, especially shame. Satan's called the accuser of the brethren. You know, God's not the accuser. Satan loves to just accuse and deceive. You, you have no power. God didn't speak to you. God didn't call you. You're a loser. You're stupid. You're this. You're that. You know, that is Satan, actually. And he's trying to cripple the seed that God's put in your heart. But... If it is, you know, in alignments with the scripture, if it is inspirational, like out of the blue, like something I never would have thought of, I think that's from God. Like if it just comes like lightning, and I wasn't even, especially if you weren't even thinking about it, just out of nowhere, it's like, bam, this thing hits you, I think that's the Lord. And the more you do, the more you discern these three things, the more it'll be like talking on a cell phone where God can inspire you or impress upon you important things in life and there will be key moments once every couple years maybe where or maybe every day depending but you know where God really can move on you in these ways becomes a very powerful thing last footnote you can't hear God's voice if you don't listen and uh, I think that boredom is gonna is the greatest barrier between you and the spiritual life so many of us have become so non-tolerant of boredom we can't sit quietly and meditate anymore. It's always reaching for a cell phone or a book or a journal or a cup of coffee. Coffee's okay. But other than coffee or tea, if you're British or something, you have to be able to press through boredom. Boredom is the greatest incubator of creativity and inspiration I think there is. If you got thrown into prison for a day by yourself and it was kind of a clean environment and you weren't scared, you'd probably come up with some really great stuff. There, there's something about those... There's something about all of those distractions and needing to check my Instagram and my whatever that are hindering your ability, probably, for many of us to hear God's voice and, and hindering us from creating some of the best stuff we've ever done. All right, Father, we thank you that you speak today, that you want to speak to us. So we open our hearts and we say we're willing, it's possible, at the very least, that you could speak to your sons and daughters. So we ask, Lord, in the name of Jesus, to speak to us. We thank you that you love us, that you've forgiven us, that you've called us and renewed us. We trust you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
We're so glad you joined us today on Hour of Power. We're always hoping that when you watch this program, you're inspired and you receive hope. If ever there's a time when the world needs kindness, it's right now. We've all been through a lot in the past year, and the turmoil we've witnessed has caused society to appear increasingly cold. People are longing for a reminder that they matter, and we have the awesome privilege of letting them know that they do. Here at Our Power, we believe that kindness matters and that if the world experiences the unbreakable and unshakable love of God, it will be transformed. That's why we're so passionate about sharing the good news with people. And it's why making happy and whole students of Jesus in every corner of the earth remains our mission. As always, we're committed to introducing millions more to our Savior, but it will be only possible with your continued help. Summer's historically been a pretty tough time financially, not just for us, but for every ministry and nonprofit. And this year really is no exception. Today, we're looking for friends like you who will empower us to continue bringing this life-changing program to the whole world. We serve a kind-hearted and benevolent God. And because He's been so good to us, we want to passionately share His blessings with others. But we can't do it without your help. For your generous donation of $60 or more, we'll send you the Kindness Matters gift set. This two-piece set features a glass infuser water bottle embossed with a stunning floral motif and the phrase, Kindness Matters, on the outside and a stainless steel infuser on the inside. Fill it with coffee grounds, loose leaf tea, a tea bag or fruit to create your favorite beverage. Your infuser is double walled to keep warm and cold liquids insulated longer and the bamboo lid is perfectly fitted to guard against leakage. We'll also include a matching Kindness Matters rectangular glass plaque Featuring a floral design and a bright navy blue background, the stylized flowers pop in warm shades of coral, green, and yellow. The weight and shape of the plaque allow it to stand alone without a base, so it can be easily displayed in your home. Both items come packaged in sturdy, coordinating gift boxes, and our prayer is that they'll be a constant reminder to choose kindness so others can see Jesus shining through you. Call, write, or go online and request the Kindness Matters gift set for your generous donation of $60 or more. Hannah and I are incredibly grateful for the way you uphold us. Your financial support provides the foundation we need to continue reaching our friends all around the world. So thank you so much. And remember as always, God loves you and so do we. Hey, church family, if you've enjoyed this sermon, remember to give it a thumbs up and let me know what ministered to you in the comments section. From all of us here at Hour of Power, God loves you and so do we.